Well, it's a blessing to be here with you men. I uh, consider being at the Master Seminary twice as two of the greatest blessings, among the greatest blessings of my life. I, um, I loved my time in the MDiv, and, and my time in the Doctor of Ministry was just as wonderful and special as that, and so I'm thrilled to be here. I am, I am, a, I am a TMS guy. I love the Master Seminary. I am thankful for the Master Seminary, especially the support that we received as we went through that time of difficulty and struggle to have my seminary stand with me was amazing. And so we are so blessed to be here, and I'm thankful to be here myself. And so thank you so much for this opportunity now to bring the Word of God to you. I'm going to address you this morning from 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 13, and the title of the message is A Summons to Suffer. And I want to go ahead and begin by reading this portion of Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 2, We're going to read verses 1 to 13, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The call to pastoral ministry is a call to a life of suffering. And one of the metaphors that brings that out is the pastor as soldier. And I want you to consider some of the similarities between a soldier and a pastor. A soldier is enlisted for combat. He has a clearly defined mission. He has clearly declared orders. And he must not only discharge his duty, but must do so knowing that doing so will lead him right into conflict and suffering. It may even cost him his life. And that's important to understand because when a pastor is met with suffering, he might be inclined to attempt to avoid it, to chart a different path, to sidestep the affliction. But it's the pastor as soldier that rules that out. He can't adapt his ministry. He can't modify his message. And he can't meddle with the orders of his commanding officer. Pastors don't have that prerogative. They've been divinely commissioned. They've been given a divinely directed duty and they must discharge their duty knowing full well that doing so will inevitably lead them directly into suffering. You see, it's the pastor as soldier that's not trying to figure out which hill to die on. The pastor as soldier is called to be faithful and obedient. The hill to die on chooses him. Nor is the pastor as soldier seeking some clever and creative way to be faithful. That's insubordination. Instead, with resolve and conviction, he aims to execute the orders of his commanding officer, and his commanding officer is who? the Lord Jesus Christ. And Timothy needed to hear this. He'd been overcome by a spirit of timidity, a timidity that was rooted in the fear of man. There was opposition within the church itself from false teachers, from biblically unqualified elders, from women vying for positions of authority, from those despising his youthfulness. Just see 1 Timothy for all of that. But in addition to that, there was also opposition from outside the church. Paul himself was imprisoned. 
His imprisonment was a direct result of the persecution of Christians under Nero, and his death for the sake of Christ and the gospel was both certain and imminent. And so Timothy, under the immense weight of that opposition, had begun to retreat, to give up ground, to avoid confrontation, to hold back in his preaching, to employ a measure of pragmatism in his ministry, and to chart a path of least resistance. And so in chapter 1 and verse 6 and following, Paul writes this, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. In fact, it even seems that Timothy was experiencing a degree of shame. And so in verse eight, Paul writes, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. And so from a dark and probably cold and wet prison cell, with his own death looming in the balance, Paul exhorts Timothy to get back in the game, to put his hand back to the plow and to suffer hardship with him as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And it's important to note that Paul had an immense love and affection for Timothy. He refers to Timothy as his beloved son in verse two of chapter one. Timothy was Paul's spiritual son and Paul was Timothy's spiritual father. And so though Paul exhorts Timothy with a a measure of strength in these verses, it's with the affection and tenderness of a father as he appeals to his beloved son in the faith. And a lot was riding on Timothy. He was the next in line. He was about to receive the baton of ministry from the apostle Paul. And it would be his responsibility to ensure the apostolic message was passed on to the next generation. And so he needed to heed this. And really, it needs to be heated again. Because it would seem, at least to me, that many pastors are struggling with the same spirit of timidity, an unwillingness to suffer, a lack of biblical conviction, and even a measure of shame around the truth. And if it's not timidity, it's arrogance. As pastors court the esteem of the culture and unwittingly shun, shun rather, their Lord and master. And you guys need to hear this. You guys are on deck. You guys are the next in line. You're preparing for that day when you will step into ministry. And so as you train here at the master seminary and as you get ready to go into ministry, even as the culture all around us is growing more and more hostile to Christ, this needs to set the expectation There's a a preparation that takes place in seminary, not just in the the study and the the training that goes on here, but even in preparing your heart for what's before you. And so our aim is to do that today. To put before you what you're signing up for, to make sure that you're prepared to sign on the dotted line and then follow through in faithfulness. And I wanna pick up on the imagery of a soldier and frame this whole thing around what it means to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And so we're gonna see four traits of a good soldier. Four traits of a good soldier. The strength of a good soldier, the succession of a good soldier, the suffering of a good soldier, and then finally the solace of a good soldier. All so that we might set the right expectation and ensure that you are preparing your mind and your heart and your families for a life of suffering. Note first, the strength of a good soldier. The strength of a good soldier. Verse one, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy needed to be strong. A good soldier must be strong. And yet the strength that he needs doesn't come from within himself. This is a strength that comes to him as he's acted upon by another. Timothy was to be strong by a gracious enabling power that would come to him and the source of that power is Christ. And so though Timothy didn't possess this grace, he bore the responsibility to be on the receiving end of it. He couldn't generate it on his own, 
It didn't come from within him. He's not the source of it. But nevertheless, Paul here is commanding him to be strong in it. And so there's a responsibility that he be on the receiving end of it. And to do that, he needed to press into Christ. The grace of Christ needed to pump through his spiritual veins. And so he needed to ensure that he was living in vital union with Christ and allowing the the rich nutrients of the vine, the true vine of John 15, to pump through his spiritual veins and provide him with the strength that he needed to be strong. Paul references this strength elsewhere. He does so in Ephesians 6.10, where he writes this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And so it's the strength of the might of Christ that we're to be strong in. He does so also in Philippians 4.13, where he writes this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Referring in context to circumstantial contentment, but applying to any and all obedience. And he does so in 1 Timothy 1.12, where he writes this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me trustworthy, putting me into service. Paul saw Christ as supplying him with everything that he needed for faithful ministry. And so this is a command to always and ever be being strong by means of the grace which finds its source in Christ Jesus. And this was critical. I mean, what Timothy was being called to here was well above him. He had no capacity within himself to fulfill what Paul was laying before him. He would need the grace of Christ to carry this out. And so how would Timothy tap into this? How do you tap into this? Well, one, by taking a spiritual inventory of your life. See, somewhere along the way, Timothy had gotten off track, whether intentionally or unintentionally, he had drifted from his pastoral calling. We know that fear had entered in. He was wrestling with timidity, both the fear of man and the fear of suffering. There may have been a weariness that had settled in, resulting from the relentless rigors of pastoral ministry. Pastoral ministry is going to exhaust you. There may have been a desire to be esteemed among men, that he had begun to seek the pleasure and praise of men. He may have been even pursuing novelty in ministry, new and innovative ways to fulfill his calling, or there may have been other earthly distractions, the affairs of everyday life that were getting in the way. Whatever it was, it needed to be identified and turned from. To tap into the strengthening grace of Christ, Timothy would have to take inventory of his life. Two, Timothy would have to humble himself. Timothy would have to humble himself. Now, why would that be? Because God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble, 1 Peter 5, 5. And so Timothy, to be on the receiving end of the grace of Christ, would need to scan his life for any and all expressions of pride, self-reliance, self-preservation, selfish ambition, an overestimated view of himself, or even the pursuit of vainglory. Timothy needed to identify and repent of any and all pride and humble himself under the mighty hand of God. Humility is absolutely critical to tapping into the strength of Christ. Three, Timothy would need to confess his weakness, to embrace it, to see his weakness as a badge of honor. You say, why'd that be? Because as Paul says, when I'm weak, I'm what? I'm strong. Weakness isn't just an asset in serving Christ. It's absolutely essential Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness, 2 Corinthians 9, 12, 9. And so weakness becomes a matter of boasting, which is why in the same verse, Paul goes on to say, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And so you need to embrace weakness. When you have an opportunity before you and and you know that it's beyond you, praise God, that's exactly where you need to be because there's a a power that you need from him and you, you can only really be on the receiving end of that power in a recognition of your weakness. 
Anytime you see strength in a man's ministry, it is the strength of Christ. All that we bring to the table is fear, trembling, and weakness. And really, if that were not so, then that would mean that the the man is doing his ministry in the flesh. And that is a horrifying thought. Because doing your ministry in the flesh is going to result in destruction when God brings that out and exposes that for what it is. And so to tap into the strength of Christ, Timothy would have to confess his weakness. And all of us are far weaker than we realize. Four, Timothy would need to renew his resolve to mortify his sin. Timothy would need to renew his resolve to mortify his sin. The mortification of sin is the initial fruit of repentance, a renewed commitment to put sin to death, put the deeds of the flesh to death. It's possible that Timothy had become slack in dealing decisively with his sin and had begun to make room for it in his life. That had to end. Sin quenches the enabling grace of Christ. And so Timothy would have to get back to to dealing honestly and seriously with his sin, to be killing sin, lest sin be killing him, to confess his sin, to put off his sin, to put righteousness on in his place and to do so in the power of the spirit. And so to tap into the strength which Christ supplies, Timothy needed to renew his commitment to the pursuit of holiness. Fifth, Timothy would need to renew his commitment to fulfill his ministry. Timothy would need to renew his commitment to fulfill his ministry. Timothy was on earth for one thing. He was on earth to fulfill his ministry and anything vying for supremacy over that needed to be laid aside. If Timothy was going to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, he would need to renew his commitment to to his pastoral calling. And so that's number one. To be a good soldier, you need to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And he has an abundant supply of grace and an infinite and eternal and endless supply of grace. All of the grace that you need to fulfill your ministry, Christ has. And it's available to you and you must be strong in that grace. Second, the succession of a good soldier. The succession of a good soldier. Look at verse two. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy had been entrusted with a deposit of truth. In fact, Paul exhorts Timothy to guard that deposit a few verses earlier. Chapter one and verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. It consisted of that which Timothy had heard from Paul, namely the gospel and the truth of the word of God in general. And it was that which Timothy, what he had heard Paul preach and teach in the presence of many witnesses, that was this deposit he had received, referring to Paul's public preaching ministry. And really, you should look at your time here at the Master Seminary as that. You are being given a deposit a deposit of truth, and you are to guard that deposit, to protect that deposit, to be faithful to that deposit of truth. And I I can tell you that I see my ministry in that way. I receive certain things here at the Master's Seminary, and my desire is to conduct my ministry in a way that the Master's Seminary and my professors would be able to smile upon my ministry. You should have that desire and ambition in your heart. Ultimately, to the glory of Christ, yes, but we recognize there's a succession plan and the the master seminary is fulfilling this succession plan. And so you are being entrusted with certain things and are called to be faithful with what's been entrusted to you. And even then, when you receive that, you you are to entrust that deposit to other faithful men, men of excellent character who had shown themselves to be both able and faithful in handling the word of God. This was Timothy's task. They were to be 2 Timothy 2.15 men, which just a few verses later says this, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. 
And then, so Paul to Timothy, Timothy to other faithful men, and then they in turn were to teach others also. And so you have four levels of succession here, from Paul to Timothy, from Timothy to faithful men, and then from them to other faithful men. And really when you sum that up, Timothy was responsible to train up biblically qualified elders, men who had been called, possessing an insatiable desire for the work of the ministry. I mean, that's the critical feature. When you're looking at men who are called, the qualifications absolutely of of moral character, they gotta be in place, and the ability to teach, absolutely. But you want genuine calling, an insatiable desire, even among your non-staff elders, to do the work of the ministry. 1 Timothy 3.1, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. There should be a a desire to do a work and the aspiration to equip oneself to get there. And yes, men who are above reproach, 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy 3:2, and men who are able to both teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict, Titus 1:9. Now, a lot could be said about this and the importance of training men, but let me just accentuate one feature. The most critical ingredient in training up men is a strong pulpit ministry. And if you wanted an illustration of that, just consider the pulpit ministry of John MacArthur. Now, I realize in using his example that we are, we're going to the, the sky here, but nevertheless, it's from this pulpit here in this chapel that that worship center came into existence, that the master seminary is here on this campus, and that the gospel is going around the world through his preaching ministry. And so it's preaching that's the primary means, the primary ordinary means by which the church is built up to all maturity. And so though every ministry of the word is important, it's the preaching of God's word that's preeminent. And it's the preaching of God's word that feeds and fuels every other ministry of the word. And really, it's not that hard to demonstrate even just by looking at the church today. How strong is the church of Christ today? It's pretty weak. How strong are the pulpits? They're pretty weak. Weak pulpit, weak church. And so as you think about training yourself for ministry, and if you're going to be a man that's gonna step into a lead preaching role, then you need to have a, a rigid conviction on the preaching of God's word, that you would preach it in season and out, that you would reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. But it's not enough to merely preach the word. From there, Timothy must ensure the word of God is applied and implemented in every aspect of the life of the church. To just preach the word and not ensure the word of God is governing the entire life of the church is gonna undermine the preaching of the word. There needs to be a correlation between the preached word and the life of the church. And so the word of God must govern every aspect of the life of the the church, its worship, its, its ministries, its fellowship, everything. Now, having said that, it's gotta be a gracious implementation. And I can just think of my own experience in the church that I'm in now. It was a solid church plant. And so a lot was already in place, but there were some things that needed some sharpening. And by the grace of God, providentially, apart from me planning it, he would just bring opportunities where those matters of our ministry needed to be addressed. And it was right there in front of me. I wasn't trying to address those issues, but the Lord just brought them to to, to the forefront of my mind and ministry. And therefore, I was in a place providentially where it was time to graciously and slowly and agonizingly move those ministries toward a more biblical philosophy of ministry. And so it can't be harsh, heavy-handed. It's gotta be gracious, providential, prayerful. And it may take a long time to get a church to where it needs to be, but nevertheless, it's gotta happen. Especially as the stakes only increase, as the world around us gets more hostile to Christ. And then even then, not just to preach the word, not just to ensure the word of God is governing the entire life of the church, but Timothy must practice what he preaches. 
he must practice what he preaches. It must be evident that the word of God has shaped his life. His life must indicate that he too is a man under authority and under the authority of the word of God. Not with perfection, of course, but with a clear direction. Timothy's always going to be preaching a higher, a higher standard than he can actually attain to, but nevertheless, it should be evident that he is striving for that standard. Again, if there was a, a disconnect between the preaching of the word of God and Timothy's life, it would undermine the preaching of the word of God. And so all three realities got to be in place. Way more could be said about the succession plan, but nothing more important than that. The preaching of the word of God is the way to multiply, is the way to duplicate. That's the, the succession of a good soldier. Now third, the suffering of a good soldier. The suffering of a good soldier. Verse three, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Again, the call to pastoral ministry is a call to a life of hardship and suffering. Paul was writing, as you know, from a, a jail cell with his own death looming over him. And so it's in that context that Paul exhorts Timothy to join together with him in suffering for the sake of the gospel. Suffering is a major theme in this epistle. Again, back in verse eight, we saw join with me in suffering for the gospel. And so Timothy was to suffer and enter into this suffering with Paul. And Timothy knew Paul's sufferings very well. He probably could have listed them all himself. He could have named them all on his own. And this is what a good soldier does. He suffers. He suffers for Christ and for the sake of the gospel. And that word good there can be rendered blameless or excellent. So suffering is one of the traits of an excellent soldier. And Paul even accentuates the, the, the certainty of this in 2 Timothy 3.12 when he says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And it's likely that Timothy was shrinking back, that there was a reluctance in him to enter into his share of the suffering, to, to take the path of least resistance. And so Paul exhorts him here to be an excellent soldier and to suffer hardship with him. And to spur him on, he gives him three analogies, three pictures that depict the kind of service he's to render, each one calling for a particular quality. One that's not only characteristic of a good soldier, but will inevit inevitably lead Timothy right down the road marked by suffering. So Paul's gonna give Timothy three analogies. And if, if Timothy is, is faithful to walk out these analogies, it's gonna lead him right into conflict and suffering, unavoidably. The first calls for single-mindedness. Look at verse four. It says, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. To entangle oneself in the affairs of everyday life is to allow civilian affairs to stand in the way of faithful service. Now, could Timothy be completely free of the affairs of everyday life? No. But to become so engrossed in them that faithful service is hindered would be a dereliction of duty and would fail to please the one who enlisted him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Timothy was to be single-minded, dedicated, wholehearted, he was to have it as his ambition to be pleasing to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, where the pleasure of Christ over his life and ministry would be more precious to him than anything. And really this call to be single-minded in the context of a soldier was gonna expose certain things. It would expose the fear of man in Timothy's heart since it would mean opposing the will and agenda of certain groups and individuals within the church. It would potentially expose the fear of suffering that was in his heart. Since this would mean faithfulness at all costs. It would expose a commitment to his comforts since suffering is uncomfortable 
or it might expose an overattachment to one's life and possessions. That Timothy was just too attached to this world. Single-mindedness in the context of suffering as a good soldier would mean being willing to lose it all in faithful service. Timothy couldn't let any of that stand in his way. And when suffering would inevitably come, he was not to change course, but was to remain single-minded with a view toward pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first analogy, a call to single-mindedness. Now the second, and this time Paul uses athletic imagery. It's a call to submissiveness, to submissiveness. Look at verse five. It says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Not only did competition demand training a certain way, there were specific requirements that had to be met to even qualify for the competition. And then once in the competition, one had to play according to the rules. And that word there, rules, can be rendered lawfully. You must compete lawfully and a failure to do so would forfeit the prize. And so Timothy was not free to rewrite the playbook, to rewrite the rule book. He had to compete according to the rules that were given to him. And so as opposition would arise and the prospect of suffering would dawn, he couldn't change the playbook. He had to remain faithful to that which was given to him. And of course, the temptation when the heat is on is to do what? It's to modify the message just a little bit. Accommodate the culture just a little bit. Tweak the biblical mandate and to do so in the name of wisdom and public testimony or some other excuse disguised as virtue. No, Timothy doesn't have that prerogative. He hasn't been given that license. Instead, he's to be single-minded and submissive to his commanding officer as he enters into his share of suffering, being strong by the means of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And if he remains faithful, faithfully submissive, competing according to the rules, it even notes he'll receive an eschatological prize. When he hears the words, well done, good and faithful slave. And so Paul gives him an analogy with a, a, an incentive that there's a reward at the end of this. A reward that Paul even refers to in chapter four. When he says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has already come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Then he says this, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so there's a, an incentive to faithfulness. And so submissiveness, single-mindedness. Third, there's a call to sweat. A call to sweat. Verse six, it says, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. And the stress on this verse is on the hardworking farmer. That's where the accent is on this verse. And that word rendered hardworking means to exert oneself physically, mentally, or spiritually. It can be rendered work hard, toil, strive, or struggle. And to labor this way is to labor to the point of exhaustion, to the point of weariness. And that's exactly what the hardworking farmer does. And he does that all the while anticipating his share of the crops. And so Timothy was to spend all of, all of himself for the cause of the gospel, to labor to the point of exhaustion in God's field. And if there's any note of reward here, I believe too, it's eschatological. That Timothy is to abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that when the harvest comes in at the end of the age, he will be immensely satisfied. If he lays down his life for this work and he fulfills his ministry, when all is said and done, there will be no regrets. No regrets. 
There will be no regrets, just the satisfaction of the, the words of his commanding officer, well done, good and faithful soldier, and even the smile of his own conscience that he faithfully discharged his duty. And then Paul says this in verse seven, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy was to mull this over. He was to think through these analogies and what they said about his life and what they exposed in his heart that needed to be addressed. Timothy was to think carefully about these things, trusting the Lord would grant him the understanding and insight he needed to make appropriate application to his life. And so you're called to suffer as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And that demands single-mindedness, submissiveness, and sweat. Three qualities that characterize a good soldier and guarantee suffering. Because if you are faithful to this roadmap, then you are going to walk a very clear and straight line. And inevitably that, that line is going to lead you directly into conflict and suffering, both in the church and outside the church. And so how do you cultivate these qualities? Let me give you just three ways in order of importance. The first is a personal devotion to Christ. Your walk with Christ needs to be authentic. It needs to be intimate. There needs to be an honest walking with Christ. There needs to be time in prayer and the word personally. And I realize that as guys in seminary, you've got very little time and a, a lot of study. But there should be a practice and a habit of carving out time to be alone with the Lord in his word and prayer that is disconnected from the study or any ministry obligations that you have. You need to cultivate a rich and robust personal relationship with Christ. And so personal devotion to Christ. Second, you need to work hard in seminary. You need to work hard in seminary. You are here at seminary to be trained to handle the word of God in whatever capacity you're gonna be serving the Lord in. And so you've got one shot, three years, four years, 10 years, whatever it is, you've got one shot. And so you wanna make sure that you are a sponge and are soaking up everything that's being poured into you. Yeah, it's like drinking out of a fire hose, but nevertheless, you need to work hard in seminary and devote yourself to this time of training and surely there needs to be ministry involvement. There's no question, but you are here in your service to be trained. That is your service to Christ and his church. You are here to be trained to handle the word of God. And so work hard in your studies. And then one other thing, it's time to lay aside childish things. It's time to look at your life and start to think about what it's gonna be like to be out in ministry. And there's certain things, whether it's entertainment or anything else that are in your life that you might deem to be childish. And there comes a point where you need to lay that aside. It's not gonna help you. It's not gonna enhance and amplify your ministry. And so you need to identify the childishness that's in your life and lay that aside and go into ministry unencumbered by things that are gonna hold you back. By this point, Timothy would have been challenged. He's been wrestling with timidity. He's taken himself out of the race. He's trying to find a way to be faithful and yet avoid suffering. And Paul is saying, no, Timothy, you've got you to walk that difficult road. You've got to go down that path. There's no other way. Suffering is the only way. You've got to go down that road, Timothy. And Timothy is being prepared to receive the baton of ministry. I mean, imagine being in Timothy's shoes and Paul's on the cusp of losing his life. Then Timothy's the next one in charge. No more Paul to lean on, to look to. And so the weight of the world must have been on his shoulders. And so Paul provides him with some comfort, some solace, and so note forth the solace of a good soldier. 
the solace of a good soldier. In verses 8 to 13, Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. And so Paul points him to Christ, the one who died in his obedience to the Father, the one who suffered under the wrath of God upon the cross, died, went into the grave, and rose on the third day. Paul is pointing Timothy to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the forerunner for suffering. He's already blazed the trail. Paul's just following in his footsteps. And Paul is now pointing Timothy to Jesus because not only has he blazed the trail, but Jesus has conquered the grave. And so Timothy being in Christ can lose his life knowing he will live again, knowing that absent from the body is present from the Lord. And so Paul exhorts Timothy to remember Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. And then he points out in verse nine, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. It is that glorious message of the gospel that Paul is joyfully and willingly suffering persecution. He's in a jail cell that was a thousand times worse than mine. And he is hopeful and optimistic and joyful and pouring into Timothy, filled with love, affection for Christ, and he, he notes that though he's in prison, the word of God isn't. He says, but the word of God is not imprisoned. In fact, no doubt his imprisonment was even working for the greater cause of the gospel, like it did in Philippians 1 during his first imprisonment. You can't, you can't chain the gospel. You can't imprison the gospel. And so Paul is in a jail cell about to die with full confidence that the gospel will go forth with power and clarity. And that's why he lived. Look at verse 10. He says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Paul was laying down his life for the elect, spending himself to win all whom God had marked out from before the foundation of the world. The, the doctrine of election was not hindering his evangelistic zeal. It was fueling it. And look at the, the aim and the purpose of that, so that they may also obtain salvation, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. I mean, think of laying down your life for the gospel and, and, and knowing that you are ministering to a people and you are trying to get them all the way to the end. You, you, are, you are laboring with the word of God in the gospel to, to bring up people all the way to the end and you get there and you're all together and you can rejoice that these folks have made it all the way to heaven. Yes, of course, it's Christ that preserves them. I mean, nevertheless, look what the apostle Paul says to Timothy back in 1 Timothy 4. Verse 16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching persevere in these things for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. I mean, the stakes are high, but what a blessing it would be to be faithful all the way to the end, even lose your life for Christ and watch God bring in the harvest. And then Paul closes with this trustworthy statement, verse 11, he says, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Our union with Christ is undergirding that. We died with Christ and were raised unto newness of life. If we died with him, we will also live with him, both now in newness of life and later in the resurrection. He says in verse 12, if we endure, we also will reign with him. That's pointing to a future reign, future tense. We are not presently reigning with Christ now, though he is seated far above all rule and authority in the heavens, but we will. If we endure, we will reign with him when he comes in his kingdom. And when he reigns from and over the earth, at that time, we will reign with Christ. He says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. And that denial there is not like Peter in that moment of weakness where he denied the Lord three times. No, this is a settled denial. If we deny Christ, 
he will deny us at his coming. And then verse 13, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Even in our moments of weakness, even where Timothy may be having a somewhat faithless moment, Christ remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And if you are in Christ, then you are a member of his body. And so Paul comforts Timothy as he calls him to this path of suffering, to put wind in his sail, to look beyond the circumstances, beyond the suffering, beyond this life to the life to come. when everything's in and all strife has ceased. And I would just say this, that now more than ever, at least in my lifetime, we need men of conviction. We need men who are gonna be good soldiers of Christ Jesus, who are gonna be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, who are gonna be faithful to provide a succession plan where they are pouring into other godly men and raising up other godly soldiers, men who are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ and men who truly find solace in that which one ought to find solace in, the very message of the gospel itself. And so the question is this, are you ready to suffer? I mean, as you look at where you are right now, and I wouldn't have had this on my mind per se when I was in your seat, over 10 years ago, are you ready to suffer? If you aren't, then you're in the wrong place. You're signing up for the wrong vocation. This is a a call to suffer, to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul and be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. But I would say this, if you are, I can think of no better reason to lay down your life. If you had one life to live, this is the life to live. This is the one to live. And to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel, even if it costs you everything, will be gloriously worth it when all is said and done, amen? Let's pray together. Well, Father, it's a blessing for me to be here in this room with these men, knowing that I was in their seat not that long ago. And obviously you have worked in my life in a way that is is what it is. There's been a degree of suffering. None of us know what's on the horizon. There are men here who may have roads before them that are marked by a serious measure of suffering. Father, make each one of us ready to follow in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. Make each one of us faithful to the end. Make each one of us a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to lay hold of that which lies ahead. Father, be glorified in our lives We pray, and I would even pray specifically that you would raise up men from this group right here to do phenomenal work for your kingdom. Do that, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.